Why am I searching? You've never used them before. Well, thousands of previously classified documents regarding UFOs have now been released to the public, and some of the stories include alien abductions, electrical paralysis, and even sexual encounters. Yeah, just Pilots tracking unidentified objects, balls of light suspended over the ocean, UFOs chasing warships, a 1,500-page Pentagon report of previously classified documents cataloging accounts from witnesses and victims claiming radiation burns, brain damage, even paralysis after close encounters with UAPs. This is the most haunting of all the reports from, from my perspective because it shows immunological deficiency. It shows uh, altering human DNA. It shows degradation on a cellular level. Prepared in 2010 by the Pentagon's secret Advanced Aerospace Weapons Program, the report was released only after a Freedom of Information request. It found sufficient incidents, accidents have been accurately reported, and medical data acquired. Humans have been injured from exposure to UFOs, from abductions and perceived time loss, to sexual encounters and unexplained pregnancies. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silent, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. Two distinct phrases of the Mockingbird you'll always hear as part of the script science fiction becoming reality, now sci-fi becoming reality, and seems to break the laws of physics. They seem to break the laws of physics. And just as religion has its holy scriptures, so do the agents of the counterfeit construct. They are counterfeit construct peddlers, as I like to put it. Remember, a counterfeit looks very much like the real thing, but in reality is a worthless copy with absolutely no substance, intended to rob you of the real deal. The great science fiction writers of the 19th and 20th centuries, H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, Mary Shelley, Isaac Asimov, Aldous Huxley, Arthur C. Clarke, and more, were held in high esteem because of their talent to extrapolate ideas that shape a possible future world. They were visionaries who made hopeful predictions across several scientific disciplines to construct the blueprints for a socialist utopia known as the New Atlantis. The revolutionaries wanted talented thinkers to seed ideas, to write a new set of scriptures, to craft a new worldview and a new world religion, one that would instill religious ecstasy, if you will, in obedience from the masses so they would dutifully serve what Plato called the philosopher kings, the scientific leadership of the technocratic global federation. This priest class of visionaries were the prophets of this counterfeit world. H.G. Wells was a devoted socialist evolutionist and high priest of futurist planning for, in his words, quote, the imminent possibility of a great world order foreshadowed by scientific and industrial progress, end quote. 
Born into a middle-class family, his talent for writing and his devotion to utopianism garnered him attention from the wealthy world socialists who then granted him scholarship to an elite education at the finest British institutions, which included, incidentally, an opportunity to study under quote-unquote Darwin's bulldog, socialist evolutionist, eugenicist, and globalist theoretician T. H. Huxley, who was the grandfather of fellow Fabian socialist Aldous Huxley, another architect for the plot, who ingeniously captured, as did Wells, this Fabian-style dystopian plan for global technocratic control in his novel Brave New World. Wells' talent for depicting his vision of the entropy of the religious capitalist world system, as well as his flair for creating clever war propaganda, garnered him attention from wealthy radicals and elite industrialists, greatly elevating his status. These technocrats believed that their new Atlantis could only rise when the current system was completely dismantled. Dystopian entropy is always part of the storyline for these people. It's the occult alchemical process of deconstruction before reconstruction, death and rebirth. Wells was a high-degree Freemason, so this thinking comes as no surprise. Many believed it was H.G. Wells who was the visionary behind ideas that were way ahead of his time. But more than likely, Wells was just willing to boldly write about ideas the intelligentsia were already concocting, like doomsday weapons, smart cities, assisted human evolution through technology, otherwise known as transhumanism, and the alien mythos. In his book, The Time Machine, reveals Wells' obsession with class division as he imagines the catastrophic effects of late-stage capitalism on nature and the human race, which included this evolutionist notion of transmutation of the species. Probably influenced by 19th century English socialist William Morris's utopian story, News From Nowhere, published in 1890, where in the future, money is abolished, work becomes a type of religious ecstasy, language is dramatically simplified, and every member of society lived in simple comfort in small communes. Wells wasn't promoting time travel, but rather used time travel as a literary device to extrapolate these ideas. Wells was perhaps one of the first to use the notion of the quote-unquote threat from beyond in his books, but many writers followed suit. In War of the Worlds, the threat was Martians, another use of a literary device to drive home a point. War of the Worlds chronicles the events of a Martian invasion that is heralded by a falling star, like a counterfeit star of Bethlehem. The Martians become the overlords, placing humans like animals beneath them. The Martian attack forces the collapse of the social order, chaos ensues until nukes are dropped, which doesn't defeat the Martians, displaying how powerless humans are in this situation. Science fiction was not the only medium for which Wells worked. Here are two of his non-fiction works, The Open Conspiracy, published in 1928, and The New World Order, published in 1940. The Open Conspiracy, subtitled Blueprints for a World Revolution, created what he deemed, quote, a scheme to thrust forward and establish a human control over the destinies of life and liberate it from its present dangers, uncertainties. The book proposes this idea of an elite intellectual class of scientists, scholars, and influential revolutionaries that would create and oversee the establishment of a world commonwealth. Understanding that humanity is inherently religious, he also proposes the creation of a new world religion. He explains, religion, modern and disillusioned, has for its outward task to set itself to the control and direction of political, social, and economic life. The modernization of the religious impulse leads us straight to the effort for the establishment of the world state as a duty. What he's saying here is creating a globalist world state should be done with religious-like fervor, and that a movement aiming at the establishment of a world directorate, in other words, establishing the overlords, must develop in part or as a whole into a world directorate, and by assimilation, as a whole, into a modern world community. He continues, the candid attempt to take possession of the whole world must be made in the name and for the sake of science and creative activity. It is true that man, like the animal world in general from which he has arisen, is the creature for the struggle for sustenance. But unlike the animals, man can resort to methods of escape from that competitive pressure. In his revised version of the same book published in 1933, Wells writes, quote, from our present point of view, religion is that central essential part of 
education which determines conduct. Religion certainly should tell us what to do with our lives, but in the vast stir and occasions of modern life, so much of what we call religion remains irrelevant or dumb. Let us try and bring this problem of the open conspiracy to meet and make the new world into relation with the traditions of religion. The clear-minded, open conspirator who has got his modern ideology, his lucidly arranged account of the universe in order, is obliged to believe that only by giving his life to the great processes of social reconstruction and shaping his conduct with reference to that can he do well with his life." End quote. Thomas Malthus wildly debunked theories which claimed that unchecked population growth would quickly exhaust the food supply and turn humanity into crazed savages, coupled with Charles Darwin's and Herbert Spencer's evolutionist notion of survival of the fittest and biological transmutation of the species, fuels Wells' blueprint for world revolution. For Wells, man is inherently and maniacally driven for competition for resources. Therefore, quote, intelligent control of population which puts man outside the competitive processes, there is a clear hope that directed breeding will come within this scope." End quote. That's population control through eugenics, in case you didn't catch that, and a clever insertion of the practice of it into society for the entrance to the technocratic world system of control. I'm not sure if Thomas Malthus was a Freemason, but it was English Freemason and staunch eugenicist Charles Drysdale, pictured here with Margaret Sanger, who in 1860 founded the Neo-Malthusian League to further the spread of the plan for global depopulation. By 1874, the League was under Masonic control by Annie Besant, occultist, staunch socialist evolutionist, and Helena Blavatsky's successor as leader of the Theosophical Society. I'm not sure if Herbert Spencer was a Freemason either, but his philosophies are incorporated into all of their literature. Charles Darwin, along with his father, grandfather, and son, were high-degree Freemasons of the Scottish Rite. One man passionately seduced by the scientific romances of H.G. Wells was polymath and physicist Leo Szilard. Wells' feverish technocratic utopianism appealed strongly to Szilard, who would go on to start the Hungarian Association for Socialist Students. Szilard, after reading The World Set Free, published in 1914, began working on the first atomic bomb. Written just before World War I, Wells portrays a, quote, war to end all wars, end quote, that begins in an atomic apocalypse, but ends in an enlightened technocratic utopia. Concerned that the Germans might develop nuclear weapons first, in 1939, Szilard, along with colleagues Eugene Wigner and Edward Teller, Teller was the founder of DARPA, by the way, penned that famous letter to President Roosevelt, which was also signed by Albert Einstein, thereby initiating the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos. The only viable use of this superweapon in Zillard's and his colleagues' view was to stop the Nietzsche Nazis. But when the Germans were defeated and then the U.S. bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Zillard and colleagues staunchly opposed military control of atomic weapons and fought tirelessly to prevent it. Robert J. Oppenheimer, a cruel and narcissistic man who was appointed supervisor and official spokesperson for the Manhattan Project, and who incidentally had two attempted homicides in his backstory, not to mention the very mysterious death of his then card-carrying communist girlfriend, Jean Tatlock, obtained his primary education from the Ethical Culture School. The Ethical Culture School was an institution founded by Marxist theoretician and co-founder of the Frankfurt School, Felix Adler. The Ethical Culture Movement, founded in 1877, was where the the philosophical and political foundations of modern globalism were concocted, and which generated a myriad of organizations and movements that followed that maintain strong influence among the globalist elite to this very day. Oppenheimer, it seems, was either a theosophist, or he certainly shared many of the same interests. From the inception of the Theosophical Society in 1875, and this is from their website, the first object of the Theosophical Society was to, quote, collect and diffuse a knowledge of the laws which govern the universe. Universe, end quote. And the second object, quote, to promote the study of Aryan and other Eastern literature, religions, and sciences, and vindicate its importance, end quote. The website continues, In her key to theosophy, Blavatsky cites the work of the library at the Theosophical Society is to collect works on ancient philosophies, traditions, and legends. She also specifies the need to make available translations, original works, extracts, and commentaries based on this material in order to help realize the second object. 
Theosophists set to work to fulfill this promise and have produced a number of original translations of Hindu scriptures. Two texts received the most attention, the Bhagavad Gita and the Yogi Sutra of Patanjali. Translating the Gita was an important object for the Theosophical Society, and Oppenheimer learned Sanskrit for the sole purpose of better understanding the Gita. Then he helps create a planet-destroying doomsday superweapon and names it the Trinity, after the alchemists' three primes of alchemy, their version of the Holy Trinity, Mercury, Salt, and Sulfur, or Soul, Earth, and Sun, that comprised the alchemical philosopher's stone of transmutation, and an homage to the romantic poem written about it by metaphysical occultist John Donne's The Trinity. The test, which took place precisely at summer solstice, engaged in Oppenheimer's mind the alchemical process of taking, quote, darkness to brilliant sunshine in one instant, end quote. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. We now stand 10 years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Three of these involved our own country. Despite these holocausts, America is today the strongest, the most influential, and most productive nation in the world. Progress toward these noble goals is persistently threatened by the conflict now engulfing the world. We face a hostile ideology, global in scope, atheistic in character, ruthless in purpose, and insidious in method. Unhappily, the danger it poses promises to be of indefinite duration. Now, it's my opinion that the creation of the atomic bomb might have had a lot more to do with the invention of an everlasting source of energy, the manufacturing of a mini sun, if you will. The fact that a smaller version of their initial idea could be used to erase the Niji Nachis off the map forever was just a bonus. It was in 1947 when Einstein signed another letter, this time penned by the self-proclaimed destroyer of worlds himself and addressed to Roosevelt. The document titled, Relationships with Inhabitants of Celestial bodies. Celestial? The idea was to introduce a new threat, one so great that all the world powers would be compelled to join as one force against it. And this is where the alien narrative began. Charles Galton Darwin, grandson of Charles Darwin, in his book titled The Next Million Years, published in 1953, he talks about many of the things we see today pushing us ever toward the globalist state. Things like using computer power as an oracle to dictate decisions, something we call artificial intelligence, and genetic modification to force humanity to stop being so, you know, human and behave more like robots. He talks about using nuclear fusion to create a mini-sun, a genesis machine, even if we risk a catastrophic chain reaction that blows up the entire planet and screws up outer space, it's worth it to him. The mini sun is to create an endless source of energy. Of course, that's not for us little people to enjoy. According to this author, it's only for the elite, who are the only ones allowed to procreate in the future Earth, while the rest of the population is slowly eradicated through systems that they develop that cause everyone to self-destruct. What has always been the primary goal of the physicists, then this goes all the way back to Aristotle, Archimedes, Isaac Newton, Galileo, Copernicus, just as Blavatsky had said, to collect and diffuse a knowledge of the laws which govern the universe. The goal is to unlock the mysteries of the material universe while leaving God out of the equation and then to use those secrets in an alchemical process to manipulate and control the evolution of mankind. These people, all of them, were influenced and motivated by socialist Darwinism, scientific romances, esoteric occult science, and alchemical deconstructivism to bring about a new world order, one that is ruled by a carefully appointed elite class of scientific intellectuals. 
after atomic weapons were no longer under the control of the socialists at Los Alamos, and in the hands of neocon warhawk profiteers of the military-industrial complex, it was Air Force General Henry Hap Arnold that concluded that America needed a think tank of superior scientific minds to keep the country's technology ahead of the rest of the world. Academics, military strategists like futurist and thermonuclear war gamer Herman Kahn, Mathematicians like John Nash, scientists, and a multitude of other megadeth intellectuals were deployed to develop projects like the internet, missile carrying, spy satellites, the modern computer, weather prediction technology, long distance communication, interplanetary exploration, and much, much more. Herman Kahn was also influenced by science fiction, particularly H.G. Wells and Isaac Asimov. Kahn, in his book on thermonuclear war, wrote, quote, What you are doing today fundamentally is organizing a utopian society. You are sitting down and deciding on paper how a society at war works, end quote. In his book, Thinking About the Unthinkable, Kahn writes, quote, Here we turn from historical fact to science fiction. Isaac Asimov's foundation novels describe a galaxy where there is a planet of technicians who have developed a long-term plan for the survival of civilization. This plan is devised on the basis basis of a scientific calculation of history." End quote. For Asimov, the Foundation series of books describes the same utopian Atlantean vision. The notion that this can be accomplished through mathematical calculations is a very Rand Corporation idea. Some consider Asimov the grandfather of the Rand Corporation and its desire to automate everything in modern society, which includes a world run by algorithms produced by a central AI system. It was Asimov who coined the term psychohistory, which is Asimov's notion of combining history, sociology, and mathematical statistics to make predictions about the future behavior of very large groups of people. It's this idea of centralized AI as an oracle that steers humanity forward. Is that your favorite topic area, science and science fiction? I suppose so, though I also like to write mysteries, I like to write limericks, I like to write history books, I like to annotate, I like the Bible, Shakespeare, various other things. What exactly does that mean when you annotate the Bible? Oh, well, you simply, you simply copy down all the, all the verses in the Bible and you make little footnotes and, and, and say whatever you please about each one. <laughs> it was Herman Kahn and maybe a dash of fellow nuke war gamer and father of game theory, Operation Paperclip Man, John von Neumann, who Stanley Kubrick based the main character in his film Dr. Strangelove. The Doomsday Machine was Kahn's idea, which also became an episode of Gene Roddenberry's TV series Star Trek. It was the RAND Corporation that proposed a study called The Preliminary Design of an Experimental World Circling Spaceship. Rocket science was still in its embryo stage then, but this was the original plan for that particular scientific discipline. A department populated by another paperclip scientist, Werner von Braun, and Crowley Satanist, Jack Parsons. The World Circling Spaceship would be capable of weather prediction, transform long-distance communication, and most importantly, intimidate our rivals abroad. Once the Soviets got wind of RAND and the 1960s, they nicknamed them, quote, the Academy of Science, Death, and Destruction, while others called them the quote-unquote Wizards of Armageddon. The Soviets had good reason to be intimidated by RAND, not just for their weapons development, but for their camera-carrying spy satellites. It was around that time when a man named Ivan Filimonenko developed what he called the first flying saucer. Filimonenko graduated from university where he studied rocket technology and nuclear physics. In 1951, he was directed to a top-secret research and development organization known as the Red Star. The film claims he did not participate in the creation of nuclear hydrogen or neutron bombs, but instead worked on reactors for spacecraft. They claim it was Filimonenko that proved cold fusion in 1957, no uranium necessary, but instead using heavy water. The important part is that it didn't produce neutron radiation or radioactive waste. In other words, it was ecologically clean and could also produce clean energy. Usage of this clean energy technology would save the Soviet Union 300 billion US dollars per year. And that was calculated back in the 50s and replaced coal, petroleum, and natural gas. Я занимался э, созданием ядерной энергетики, которая использовалась в космосе. И начинал, так сказать, с самых азов. Никаких не было данных, ничего. Значит, то есть самостоятельно э, пришлось разрабатывать очень крупные изделия. Вначале э, ну, потребовалось значит, данные чтобы это обеспечивать. Поэтому были применены э, борводородные топливо, типа э, пентабаран и декабаран. Дальше всего ракет? Ракет, да. 
Но дальность только можно было обеспечить порядка 12 тысяч километров по тому времени. Поэтому я занялся значит, разработкой ядерных энергетических значит, установок. И одновременно значит, проводил эксперимент. В результате этих экспериментов, чтобы это, эти изделия могли 40 раз огибать вокруг земного шара. Кроме этого, в том же 1957 году при создании своей энергетической установки Филимоненко открыл возможность создания ракетных двигателей и летательных аппаратов без отброса массы за счет отталкивания аппарата от магнитного поля Земли. Им была разработана установка с подъемной силой 5 тонн. Это была первая в мире летающая тарелка. Взаимодействует она на заряженных дисках э, с магнитным полем Земли. В результате возникает теория сила, которая значит, и, э, передвигает летательный аппарат. But we knew how the devices would operate. You know, for instance, the propulsion of craft. Everything that we have, whether it's a propeller plane or a jet or a rocket, it throws something out the back, either high-speed exhaust or a large volume of air. This is the first time there's a craft that's it's a reactionless craft. It's a field propulsion craft. Like I've said before, that's a crime not to tell humanity about that, but that's a separate thing. Meaning that there is something different in science dramatically that we're not allowed to know right that is a true statement yeah that's a true statement the fact that there is another intelligent technologically advanced civilization we have some of their objects that is really the pinnacle however the science and the technology can change us dramatically can change the way the entire world operates the economy everything A major shift in the development of this UFO worldview campaign was the emergence in the early 1950s of abduction cases and contactees, people who claimed to have direct, personal, and rather traumatic encounters with whom they believed were aliens from outer space. These accounts provided what appeared to be eyewitness testimonies that aliens were real and were, as ufologist Philip Coppins put it, quote, on an interstellar peace mission sent by some intergalactic equivalent of the United Nations, end quote. These accounts have been dismissed as hoaxes, but at the time, they had significant cultural impact. One early attempt to fool the masses into a War of the Worlds type farce was the introduction of a character named Valiant Thor. Valiant Thor was scripted as being a humanoid alien that lived in an apartment inside the Pentagon. Val was passionate about ending the possibility of nuclear war. Like many quote-unquote aliens that would follow, Val had a goal for humanity and was working through the existing power structures to make it happen. The story goes that on March 16, 1957, a flying saucer landed in a farmer's field in Alexandria, Virginia. An unarmed, human-looking man emerged from the craft and asked to speak to the president, telepathically, as it were, and he was whisked away to the Pentagon of which he was given a fully furnished apartment. According to Valiant Thor, he was sent here by a galactic council to convince humanity to shy away from their use of nuclear weapons. Val was from Venus, with the only distinction between his appearance and humans was that he had six fingers and six toes. The story goes that Val convinced then-President Eisenhower to create a council against the use of nuclear weapons, but the committee was repeatedly blocked by members of intelligence agencies. So Val recruited so-called evangelist and UFO buff Frank Strange. Strange believed the Bible depicted alien encounters, and had just written a book about an angelic encounter in the book of Ezekiel when Valiant Thor appeared on the scene. According to Strange, Val explained to him God's thoughts about humanity, and even wrote a book about about it titled The Art of Ascension, Achieving Communion with God in Creation. Of course, Val's ideas match perfectly with theosophical concepts like the idea of transcendental ascension, cosmic Christ consciousness, and the notion that the material universe is divine and conscious and that humanity can evolve to merge with it. George Adamski, who claimed to have multiple encounters with UFOs starting in the late 1940s and even took photos of what he insisted were flying saucers, claimed that he met and conversed telepathically with a visitor from Venus in a California desert. He chronicled his alien encounters in a series of books. First, Flying Saucers Have Landed, published in 1953, and its sequel, Inside the Spaceships, in 1955, the latter of which he claims to have had conversations with emissaries from Mars and Saturn. Venus, Mars, and Saturn. Do you see a pattern here? He claims he was taken to a mothership and tutored by a 1,000-year-old spaceman he called The Master, a Nordic-style extraterrestrial that looks and sounds very much like Klaatu from The Day the Earth Stood Still, and who shared the secrets of the universe with him. 
He said they came to deliver a specific message, that Earthlings should stop messing around with those darned atomic bombs. It seems Adamski was deeply influenced by Helena Blavatsky's Theosophical books. After his claims of contact with extraterrestrials, it became public that Adamski was actively supported, assisted, and under the control of the CIA, under then CIA director Alan Dulles. Even his passport that was issued for his extensive travels to give lectures and interviews was furnished by the CIA. His countless books on the subject were wildly popular with the 1960s hippie New Age community. In the name, love, wisdom, and power which thou art, to charge the consciousness of each one here with the ascended past or present, self, luminous, intelligent substance, and power of light that goes before giving each student the invincible protection by the power of light. However, one of the first UFO cults to emerge on the scene was the I.M. Activity Cult, founded in the early 1930s by Guy Ballard and his wife Edna. The I.M. movement is one of the earliest Ascended Masters cults. These Ascended Masters are believed to be humans who have lived through a succession of reincarnations in physical bodies or cosmic biological beings from other worlds, beings that originated from the primordial sun, Saturn, in the ancient civilization of Atlantis and who have achieved gnosis or secret knowledge. Over time, those who have passed through various reincarnations became highly advanced souls that are able to move beyond the cycles of re-embodiments and karma and attain their ascension, becoming immortal, discorporate beings who can communicate only with special people. The Ascended Masters are believed to communicate with humanity through certain trained mediums, according to Helena Blavatsky. This included several key theosophists like Alice A. Bailey of the Lucis Trust, the IM activity movement had up to a million followers in 1938 and is still active today. But Theosophy was a fraudulent movement from the very start. Madame Blavatsky, born from nobility, was the great-granddaughter of Prince Vasily Alexandrovich de Gorokov, who had a meticulous collection of rare books in his library. There, Blavatsky found hundreds of books by the 16th and 17th century masters of alchemy and hermetic philosophy. Her great-grandfather was a high-ranking Freemason who, in the 1770s, was initiated into the Rosicrucian order. Clearly impassioned by this occult education, made it her life's mission to rewrite human spirituality and did it in the traditional way of the Illuminist by blending humanism, esoteric occult philosophy, and early enlightenment scientism to fashion a brand new world religion. This is what they consider the study of the quote-unquote science of the soul and God's not invited to this party. The entirety of her esoteric interpretation was that people could detach from their bodies, exist in the cosmic ether of the astral plane, and communicate with people, giving them ancient wisdom from beyond, a quote-unquote brotherhood of sages who control humanity from behind the scenes. At one point, Blavatsky wrote a series of letters across a six-year period, desiring to prove the existence of this brotherhood. She wrote a series of letters, putting them before certain influential people, all supposedly written by two ascended masters from India, Kut Humi and Moriah. The letters were designed to provide proof that the masters were real and that Blavatsky was who she said she was. This gifted medium and necromancer who had the inside track on this ancient wisdom that was designed to steer humanity along a specific course. Her letters were found to be hoaxes, Blavatsky found to be a big disgusting fraud and liar, and the entire premise of her movement one giant made up pile of nonsense. It didn't matter. The elite liberal socialists of that era loved it. They wanted to believe it because it was enchanting rebellious and liberating, and they wanted to use it as a tool for the revolution. The IM movement was the precursor for several New Age and UFO cults, all led by fraudsters, like the Urantia movement, founded by physician William Sadler. Sadler was greatly influenced by close friend and mentor Harvey Kellogg, the inventor of cornflakes. Kellogg was a former Seventh-day Adventist turned transhumanist, and a very vocal eugenicist, and really a very sick sociopathic man if you read about this guy, who advocated for various practices that are so disturbing, I can't even mention them here out loud. Out. Sadler was a student of Sigmund Freud and wrote the Urantia book after working with a patient who claimed to be channeling messages from a visitor from another planet. The Urantia book is a compilation of these channeled messages. The man's name never became public, but it is thought to be Kellogg's nephew and Sadler's brother-in-law, Wilfred. 
Then there was the Aetherius Society, funded by theosophist George King in the mid-1950s. King claimed he made contact with extraterrestrial intelligences, whom he referred to as the Cosmic Masters, who required our cooperation to solve humanity's earthly problems so we could advance into the new age. On one occasion, he made TV history by going into a trance live on the BBC to relay a message from Mars Sector 6. From orbital section number two, relationship, Mars, subject, demand the truth. Um, you see, I had uh, quite an amazing experience uh, one Saturday morning while I was washing up some dishes. I had a voice, um, quite defin definitely a voice out of this world, say to me, prepare yourself, you are to become the voice of interplanetary parliament. Soon after this, I had a physical visitation from a member of uh, the cosmic hierarchy, if you like, who gave me certain instructions. Um, I obeyed these instructions to the letter, and later on, um, I found I could contact intelligences from other planets. Where did he in fact come from? Um, he, he is a man who is living uh, in northern India at the moment, but he came from another planet, I believe it was Venus. Now, when he came into your room through the locked door with his ordinary physical body, did he resemble any other human inhabitant of this planet? Or? Yes, he, he would have been taken for, um, for a, uh, an Indian, I think. I see. And this was the body which he has when he's on Venus as well? No, this, is a, this was a special body he used when he was on this Earth. What happens to it when he's not here? Um, I think uh, he is capable of breaking up the atomic structure and cellular structure and reforming another body when he goes back to Venus again. You became uh, a channel for the transmission of messages from cosmic intelligence? Yes, that's right. Yeah. You have a title which you've been given in this respect? Yes, uh, the space people refer to me as mental channel number one. Do you receive visitors from outer space in person? I have met uh, people from outer space. You've met people from Saturn? I met people from Saturn, Mars and Venus. King claimed to have heard a voice telling him that he was to be the messenger on a mission to ban the atomic bomb. King taught that Jesus was an extraterrestrial, as was Buddha and Krishna, sent to Earth to help mankind, and that the Earth is a living, breathing entity which is thousands of lives more evolved than we are. In one transmission, King maintains with what sounds more like a veiled threat of global subversion, quote, The Orthodox religions have been given every opportunity to make known the great truths. They have failed because they have chosen to exercise petty free will. Now the great truths are being released to Terra, meaning the Earth, through metaphysical means, end quote. Other cults include the Industrial Church of the New World Comforter, founded in 1973 by Alan Noonan. Noonan claimed to be transported onto a spaceship he called the Galactic Mothership, in which he says he appeared before a great light. A voice came out of this light telling him telepathically that his role on Earth was to be the New World Comforter. Noonan considered himself an incarnate spiritual master from Galactica, a cosmic adept and channel of the universal mind. He also owned a vegan restaurant, and his vegan followers lived with him in a commune called the One World Family Commune, where they practiced Crowleyan sex magic, thinking it would bring about the world revolution. There was Marshall Applewhite's Heaven's Gate cult that wove in some Star Trek flavor. We'll title this tape, uh, Planet Earth About to be Recycled, Your Only Chance to Evacuate is to leave with us. We're not saying that planet Earth is coming to an end. We're saying that planet Earth is about to be refurbished, spaded under, and have another chance to serve as a garden for another human civilization. I, in all honesty, must acknowledge my father. My father is not a human father. My father is a member of the evolutionary level above human, the kingdom of God. Now you say, well, according to religious literature, I thought there was someone else that was going to come and be our savior here at these end days, that that was going to be Christ's return. So the one or the mind that was in Jesus, what? That mind is in me? I must admit that I am here again, that I'm here saying exactly the same thing that I said then, 
trying to say it in today's language, trying to hope that for your sakes you can see what we have to offer you, for our Father offers you life. The Raelians, whom their leader claimed he had an encounter with an extraterrestrial, and that followers of Raelianism can achieve immortality through cloning technology, or by uploading your consciousness into a centralized supercomputer. And what do they look like? They look like us, because they, they created us in their image, like the Bible explained. And uh, they are like us, a little bit smaller, they have large almond-shaped eyes. When the next time you met them, in 1975, was it, you, you met them, and, and they took you with them to their yes. planet. In, 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 in what sort of a thing do they have to travel in to, to the planet? We have to, to understand that technology is 25,000 years of advance on us. So, if we imagine what was the civilization uh, 100 years ago, for instance, everything in this studio is like a miracle for our grandfather, Indeed. grandfather. Yes. The microphones, the lights, it's beyond their wildest imagination. Exactly. But can you try to imagine, after 25,000 years, what kind of civilization we will have on Earth? So, it's what is their civilization. Yes. Tell me about when you got to the planet, what, what sort of life they led anyway, when you got there. They have no, of course, they have no work, like we, we, we used to have work. We are going slowly inside this kind of civilization, but they have 25,000 of scientific advance on us. There is no money on that planet. There is no money. There is no armies. Yes. There is no violence. And there is no disease. I am so happy to see what's happening in the world right now about uh, money. The financial institutions are crumbling down, and uh, that's beautiful because it's in the Ryan message I brought more than 33 years ago, and it's happening. And uh, now uh, the, the king of the money, the dollar, is in free fall, and I think it will not stop. And uh, the only solution the Elohim explained to us is the creation of a world government and a world currency. Another fraudster jockeying to be the Antichrist New World Teacher in Get Rich Trying, former member of Aleister Crawley's Ordo Templi Orientis, L. Ron Hubbard, started a UFO cult using the same elements with the same purpose. It was believed that Crawley had opened a portal in one of his magical workings, and Hubbard, along with Jet Propulsion Laboratories' Jack Parsons, also a member of the OTO, continued the ceremonial magical working, believing they would widen the portal that Crowley had already opened. When you get to the upper levels of Scientology, the creation myth is explained to you. The story is that 75 million years ago, people lived in a world very much like the world of America in the 1950s. It was a very similar world and similar problems, one of which was overpopulation. They had elected a by the name of Zemu to the Supreme Ruler. There was a tyrannical overlord of the galactic confederacy named Zenu. In order to resolve this problem of overpopulation, he called people in, ostensibly for tax audits, and had them frozen with injections of glycol to their heart. They were flown to the prison planet, TGA. It's actually the planet Earth. And these frozen bodies were then dropped into volcanoes. And then they set off hydrogen bombs on the top of each volcano. And their disembodied spirits, these are called fakes, floated out and they were captured and forced to sit in front of movie screens. They were shown images, implants, as Hubbard would have it. Every man is shown crucified. So was the psychiatrist shown crucified. When a child is born, a Thetan will leap inside the child's body at that very instant, and it becomes like the child's soul. More than one Thetan might crowd into the body. Hundreds or thousands might. The immortal spirits of these aliens, which he called Thetans, similar to Archons and Gnosticism, possessed human beings. The goal of the Scientologists is to begin to remember this galactic trauma which Hubbard called the space opera, through many very expensive sessions called auditing. Hubbard attributed Christianity and the image of the crucifix to the influence of Zenu.
probably the most influential occult organization in modern history, and the mothership of all this nonsense, was the Fraternitas Saturni, or the Brotherhood of Saturn. In the book Fire and Ice, penned by Stephen E. Flowers, the author provides a detailed history of the order from its, quote, possible beginnings in the ancient north, end quote, as well as the doctrines and teachings rooted in the Saturnian archetype, cosmology, sexual mysticism, and Nietzschean thelemism. There were similar secret orders that predate the Brotherhood of Saturn, particularly in Nordic regions, as early as late 17th and early 18th centuries. They rooted themselves in alchemy and mathematical and Pythagorean mysticism. The order was revived by a mathematician and mystic Joseph Maria Heinronski, who is said to be the magical initiator of occultist Eliphas Levi. Heinronski was an occult master involved in Kabbalah and Gnosticism and other occult teaching. He believed that knowledge of truth was possible through human reason combined with a secret mathematical formula. However, he never seemed to communicate this formula. Eliphas Levi was a product of this nonsense and the man instrumental in the occult revival of the late 19th century. Many orders emerged from this movement throughout Europe, especially in England, in particular the Order of the Golden Dawn and the Ordo Templi Orientis. Other Freemasonic orders, like the Order of the Golden Centurium, were founded in Munich. This order was demonological, that did ritualistic magic to maintain contact with a tetrad of demons that they believed were subservient to the initiates and would provide untold personal power, influence, and wealth. Members would go on to revive the Order of the Illuminati in Bavaria in 1880 and several other orders of the same. By 1899, these orders unified until 1902, when the emphasis shifted to the development of the OTO. The evolution of these orders combined an eclectic synthesis of Masonic, Rosicrucian, Templar, Gnostic, and some forms of Indian occultism. The OTO flourished like crazy under the leadership of Theodore Roos. Roos met Alastair Crowley in 1912, and the two men joined forces of which Crowley would go on to head the order after Roos died from poor health. Besides the OTO, another order in Germany, the Pansophical Lodge, attracted the attention of Crowley in 1925. The Pansophical Lodge was comprised of several orders, lodges, and societies. It was through contact between the Pansophical Lodge and Crowley that the Brotherhood of Saturn, under the leadership of Gregor A. Gregorius, came to be. The central tenet of these orders was the traditional presence of the secret chiefs. What Blavatsky called the Ascended Masters, Crowley and the German and English Masons regarded them as secret chiefs. Their guiding force, embodied in the 33rd degree, is the superhuman, immortal, Saturnian demiurge, whom we understand to be Satan. There were constant battles over doctrine and leadership with these people, but what they were clamoring for was to unite the lodges under this cohesive synthesis of ancient and accepted Scottish Rite Freemasonry, Luciferianism, astrological mythology, Crowley's Thelema, and all manner of unspeakables under the leadership of a new world teacher, the great wild beast 666. Now let me demystify something for you. Blavatsky taught her initiates that Tibet was the location where the masters of the ancient wisdom resided. At the time of his channeled writings from Lamb, of which Blavatsky wrote The Book of Silence, Crowley was trying to persuade the Theosophical Society that he was their prophesied world teacher. In other words, Crowley was presenting himself as the mystical Tibetan Lama to the organization. Lamb, which Crowley never at any time said was an alien from another planet, but has said that Lamb was an aspect of his secret self, this rather goblin-esque avatar of himself, with such superior grasp of ancient wisdom that his head swelled up. It is this lamb that was being sold to Blavatsky as an adept of the Theosophical Gnostic Church that Blavatsky created, and for which Crowley wanted the top seat as the new world teacher, the great beast 666. Of course, Blavatsky created her Theosophical religion for the express goal of destroying Christianity, crushing the materialism of physical science, and to bring about Armageddon, a battle they believed they could win, so they could live on as gods in their depopulated utopian society reserved only for the elite, their new New Atlantis. Crowley wanted to be its pope. Michael Paul Beertu, American occultist, author, and son of a prominent theosophist, believed himself to be a lamb contactee. He viewed lamb as the, quote, subterranean burgeoning of Lucifer Gnosis, end quote. This would mean that knowing lamb is to know a welling up from the unconscious, an inner knowing of Lucifer. 
Beer too has said that Lamb is the natural mode of human evolution in the present eon, indicating to him and his followers that Lucifer Gnosis is the appropriate path of human spiritual growth at this time, of which Crowley called the great work. Salvation for these satanic Gnostics is having direct knowledge of their own supreme divinity, their own godhood, which is obtained by grasping this mystical esoteric insight. As Karl von Eckertshausen, the 18th century German occult mystic and Freemason, wrote in his book, The Cloud Upon the Sanctuary, these people believe they are the society of the elect in the invisible celestial church, which was ordained from the beginning of time, of which its members will form a theocratic republic, which will one day be the regent mother of the whole world. Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End and 2001 A Space Odyssey are the outward expression of this dominant Luciferian Saturn Gnostic New World religion. The overarching premise is the evolution of Nietzsche's Ubermensch, Clark, with Kubrick, created a visual Bible for the Saturnian Atlantean cult of the New World Order. In Childhood's End, the aliens assume control of all international affairs as they benignly position themselves as helpers for humanity. The overlords hide their appearance for quite some time until Corellan, the supervisor for Earth, reveals himself a few years later using Joe Middle America as his intermediary. The presence of these aliens ushers humanity into a utopian golden age of prosperity, at the expense of creativity, which includes material science. No real science allowed, or artistic expression because Corellan thinks it's destructive to the species. The Overlord's primary interest is psychic research that includes telepathy and telekinesis, and incorporates this big galactic Ouija board. The Overlords believe that the operator of the Ouija board was the quote-unquote channel through which the information came, and because of that, that, they're the most important human being alive. Human children begin to develop clairvoyant and telekinetic superpowers. Corellan divulges that the Overlord's purpose is to serve the Overmind, a vast cosmic intelligence that's comprised of all the ascended superkids throughout the cosmos who have already ascended. Everything that has happened on Earth was planned long ago, is natural, is the cosmos, is the Overmind. You're the Overmind. A faint reflection of it. I am all. Divisible and indivisible. I am the collective consciousness of this universe. By shepherding humans into a utopian golden age, human children are now able to undergo the next evolutionary step into the ubermensch, the superhuman. For Clark, this is the last human generation. The children of Earth are no longer children of humanity. They are destined to move beyond their physical bodies and discard their individuality and merge with the overmind. For Clark, Corellan is the devil who heralds the end of mankind in this Armageddon-like scenario, which is depicted at the end of the story as Corellan, with a massive nuke, blows up the earth and every person in it, bringing the human species to an end. In 2001, A Space Odyssey, it's the same story repeated, with obvious Darwinian and Saturnalian overtones, except in this case, the aliens are artificial intelligence, or at least they have evolved into machine superintelligence. The star child, which was David Bowman, and who was brought through this alchemical process of death and rebirth, with the forceful assistance of advanced alien technology represented as the monolith, returns to Earth as the immortal star child, where he detonates a massive nuke from Earth's orbit, utterly destroying the entire planet and all its inhabitants. The novel insinuates that biological beings have long transcended the need for physical bodies and will evolve into pure consciousness. Spielberg, who has attended Bilderberg meetings since at least 1999, is responsible for several of the top-grossing films of all time using the existential threat from beyond scenario. Films like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, E.T., Men in Black, Taken, War of the Worlds, and most recently Ready Player One, which is predictive for the metaverse, a subject I'm covering in depth in an upcoming video. Prior to making Close Encounters, Spielberg consulted with astronomer Dr. Alan Hynek, who worked for the Air Force in 1948 for projects sign, a UFO study project for the government, and also astronomer and computer scientist Jacques Vallée, who incidentally was part of the team who developed the internet. 
represented by the character Lacombe in the film. These are the men who appealed through a speech to the United Nations about constructing a UN task force to oversee and manage the UFO phenomenon, which you see played out in the film. Valet, in his book Passport to Magonia from Folklore to Flying Saucers, says that the realm of the Others, capital O Others, quote, constitutes a sort of parallel universe which coexists with our own. It is made visible and tangible only to selected people, and the doors that lead through it are tangential points known only to the elves. Valet is telling you that these Others are goblins like Crowley's lamb. Close Encounters and E.T. brought Crowley and Luciferianism into the homes of Middle America. Baked into the script is this idea of special chosen people, particularly children, who have a unique ability to connect with the other. While Clark used the red-skinned, horned, and fork-tailed devil archetype, Spielberg went for hippie boomer appeal with Crowley's goblin, Lamb. Close Encounters of the Third Kind was probably the first use of Crowley's Lamb archetype in a film. Whitley Strieber was another to use the Luciferian goblin in his film Communion. The word communion is always about connecting humans with the divine. Strieber points out in a number of his books, the visitors used Masonic principles and, in one situation, Masonic ritual in their relationship with him. Strieber, whose father and uncle were both in the U.S. military and involved in intelligence services to quite a high degree, compares his abduction encounters to MK Ultra. He claims he was enrolled in some kind of intensive training program around 1952 when he was seven years old, and wrote about it in his book Secret School, a facility pitched as a special program for bright children. According to Strieber, the school was located on an airbase, and he recalls being placed in a Skinner box, a device that was used for animals and behavioral psychology psychological experiments, and says that he and other children were part of operant conditioning psychological secret experiments. Strieber also suggests that some of the memories that he has had from this time in his life were of disturbing satanic ritual abuse that produced significant psychological trauma and maybe even psychosis. 